Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our morning service. Uh, a little later, after we've sung our first hymn, uh, this morning I'll be handing over to Joshua. He's bringing the talk for the children, and he'll also lead us in prayer and bring us our Bible reading from John chapter 3. But let's begin with a wonderful hymn of praise to our God and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus over this Christmas season, of course, very much centres upon our Saviour. Uh, and this is a wonderful hymn of praise. It reminds us that he is the Son of God and has forever been that, even before the worlds began. That he is the Lord of love and we only have to look at his pierced hands and side to be reminded of that fact. That he is the Lord of life, the one who triumphed over the grave. And in the opening line of this great hymn, uh, the one who is crowned with many crowns, as now as the risen Saviour, he is exalted on high, the Lamb upon his throne. Well, let's sing his praise in our opening hymn of worship.
Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together now. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning as this king who we've just sang of. We can do nothing but bow in your presence and praise you for all of your greatness and your goodness. We think of the image that the Bible gives us of you and how highly exalted you are, how holy and and special, set aside and pure you are. Lord, we so easily forget how how you are described. We so easily forget aspects of your nature, that you are completely separate from us, that there is no taint of sin found in you whatsoever. And Lord, we praise you for that. We praise you that you are the creator of all things, whether in heaven or on earth. And Lord, this morning we come before you together as a church, even though we we can't be physically together. Father, we are together in our spirits, in our hearts, as we are one body, one bride, one people who've been set aside by you. And Lord, we think of who we were in our sin, how we were strangers far off from you. We were rebels against you. Each of us had decided to turn away from you and, and rebel, go our own way, seek desire from our own lusts and, and passions. And yet, undeserving as we were, you decided to reach out to each of us, to choose us and create a people to your glory from the dirt. Father, we praise you this morning. We thank you for all of your tender mercies towards us and your loving kindness. We don't deserve the access that we have to your throne to pray to you. We don't deserve the breath that we can breathe in order to speak to you. And yet, Lord, through your grace, you have granted us this access to you. You've not only given us salvation, that great gift that we could never earn or deserve that was bought for us by Christ. You've not only given us that great gift of salvation, but you've adopted us. You've gone not just a step further, but you've gone every step you could go. You've exceeded anything we could imagine. Your grace has gone beyond all that we could expect in bringing us into your family, giving us your kingdom as heirs, making us to be your bride, the bride of Christ. And Father, we are humbled by that when we stop to consider how great and gracious you have been towards us. And Lord, as we think about what we studied when we last were together on Wednesday night, we we ask that you would give us hearts that seek you more and more and more. Father, we pray that you would instill that in our minds. We thank you that you are this God, as we saw on Wednesday, who is full of kindness towards us, full of grace, and you're ready to hear our prayers. You're ready to hear the cries of your people, and you're ready to respond and to answer and to act and to give joyfully and cheerfully to us. Lord, we all know how vital praying is. We all know how vital reading our Bibles is. Lord, help us to become awakened to it more and more. Help us to see the value in these simple things 
that you have given us access to, that you have granted to us. And so, Father, may we be a church who is known for our prayerfulness. May we be a people who seek after you, who read your word and understand it. Make us wise. Make us discerning. Make us ever more united together. Help us not to be separated by anything, whether big or small. Help us to foster this sense of unity. Help us to see that you have bound us together as one people. And may we love one another as you've called us to do. May we give of ourselves for one another as you've called us to do. May we esteem each other as greater than ourselves. We can so easily become puffed up with our own thoughts of pride and selfishness. Father, help us instead to be humble. Help us to lower ourselves, to live as, as though we are the least of these and lift others up, build up those around us and show them the light and the love and the grace of Christ that we have been shown. Do all this within us, we pray by your Spirit, Father. And help us this morning as we come to look at your word later from John chapter 3. Truths that are so familiar to us, yet how vital they are. Help us to grasp them. Help us to be focused and engaged. Help us to have these truths sink into our minds and plant them firmly there. We pray also for the children. We're going to have our talk for them in a second. We pray for them. We pray that these stories that they hear every week on Sundays and at BBB and even at Impact, we pray that these would become life-altering realities to them. Help them to see the great weight and the value of the things that are being taught. These are, these are things that change lives. These are things that have been revealed to us by the creator of reality. Father, we pray for their souls. We pray that your spirit would be with them and with us all as we continue this morning. Be with us as we sing, be with us as we read, be with us as we listen to your word being preached. And may your spirit within us shape us and mould us to become the people that you have saved us to be. We ask that you would do this for us, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, children, it's time for your talk. Now, last week, Ben brought us the start of a new series looking at the birth of Jesus. It's something that the world remembers at this time of year, and we're looking at it now. Last week, what was Ben telling us about? Can you remember? It was all about Mary and the angel Gabriel, who'd been sent down from heaven by God to deliver that announcement that she would have a son and that she would call his name Jesus, that he would be the saviour of his people to save them from all of their sin. Now, you all know the story that we're going to hear today. You've heard it hundreds of times. But it's really important that when we hear stories that we've heard time and time again, that we don't think to ourselves, oh, I've heard this one before. But think about how valuable this story is. Think about how important these things are. Imagine a world where these things didn't happen. And we didn't have the hope that these stories speak of. Now, the story today is what follows on after last week. Ben had told us that the angel had 
delivered that news. And as you know, Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. The governor had given a a decree that a census would be taken, a little bit like a register in school. Everyone had to be accounted for. They had to know where everyone was from and get their records straight. So Mary and Joseph travelled from where they were in Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. And as you know, when they got there, normally they'd have found a place to stay, but there was no room in the inn or any inn. There was no room at all in any of the houses where they could stay. So, what did they do? They found a feeding trough, a a manger, something that dirty animals would stick their snouts into. It's not a nice picture. It's dirty and, and, and low and unimportant. How incredible is it that the God who made everything that there is, all of creation, everything that we see and all that we are, the one who made all that, who is glorious and holy and big and powerful, like a king, the way that he would be born to us was in a dirty, low, unimportant probably smelly place that's really strange that happens a lot in the bible we think things are going to go that way but instead they they go this way god the great high holy king became a small weak helpless baby in a dirty manger, in a small town, in a far off place. God had become like us. God had become with us. And Mary, just as the angel had said, gave birth to her son. And she called his name Jesus. Now, soon afterwards, there were some shepherds in their fields doing what shepherds do, looking after their sheep. They were probably minding their own business. And then suddenly, an angel appeared. And the shepherds would have been terrified and amazed and frightened and surprised. And the angel angels always have to do this, said, do not be afraid. I bring good news, tidings of great joy. We read about this in Luke chapter 2. The angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. And what are those great tidings? What What's the good news? It's this. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, that's Bethlehem, a saviour who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. This will be how you know that you've found the baby. You will find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in in a manger and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill to men and so the angels went up into heaven and disappeared and left the shepherds alone. What an amazing sight they'd have seen. They'd have been looking at each other. What have we just witnessed? And they they said to one another, let's go, let's go and see what we've heard. And they went into this town, Bethlehem, and they found it exactly as the messengers of God had told them. They found this baby 
wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and they praised God for what they had seen. And then immediately they got up and went into the towns. They went to find people and tell them all about what they'd seen. They said that they have seen the Saviour. These shepherds brought the good news to the people. Now, why why did the angels choose shepherds? Why had God picked shepherds to bring the good news? Well, I think one important reason is because in the Old Testament, the Bible speaks of Israel, God's chosen people, sometimes as being like a flock, like a big gang of sheep. And God, a lot of the time, calls the leaders of Israel shepherds. But most of the time, all these shepherds of the flock, the leaders of Israel, they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. They were living for themselves, living in sin, not listening to what God wanted, going their own way. And God, through his prophets, spoke to Israel in the Old Testament and said, your shepherds have not been looking after you. Israel is like a a flock without a shepherd. They're, They're running around doing their own thing, living for themselves, doing what is right in their own eyes, in their own mind. But now, in the New Testament, we see God giving shepherds this message. They are caring for the people, bringing them good news. See, the old leaders of Israel, the old shepherds of the flock, they weren't doing what they were meant to do. They weren't caring for people they weren't bringing them God's word but now God's turning things around God's starting to shift things back to how they should be and he's giving shepherds the news to go and give people to go and give Israel to say here is the truth of God you see God does that a lot and this is the whole point of Jesus being born. Everything that was broken, everything that our sin had made wrong, God decided right from the beginning of creation that he would set a plan to fix it, to twist it all back to how it should be. We we are dead in our sin. We're, We're sinful and yet Jesus came to set us free and give us life. That's the message of the Bible. That's the message of Christmas, why we remember Jesus' birth at this time. God was born of man so that man might be born of God. Thank you for listening. Now, listen carefully to our next Bible reading. Don't forget the children's talk and move to the reading, because there's a link here. We're going to read John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. So if you'd like to turn there with me in your Bibles. John chapter 3 starting at verse 1, and we'll read to verse 21. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, 
How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Like the shepherds of the Old Testament. Jesus continued, Most assuredly I say to you, We speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you then believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. We're going to sing a hymn before we hear that passage preached. We're going to sing Christ Alone, Cornerstone. Let's sing.
Why did God the Father send his only begotten Son into the world? As we've been seeing, the life and ministry of Jesus was not one-dimensional. And to answer this question with any degree of comprehensiveness, you have to cover quite a lot of ground. If you don't, you can end up with a very lopsided gospel and a message which doesn't actually convey the gospel at all. Using the words of Jesus himself, we're taking a survey of some of the critical components of what he taught on this subject to enable us to answer this question. Firstly, the fact that he was a teacher. He came to preach. There is a message to proclaim. There is truth to be made known in this world of ignorance and deception in which men and women suppress the truth, exchanging it for the lie, the lie of worldliness and godlessness, the lie of the evil one. Second, we saw that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Because in our sin, we've wandered so very far away from God and were incapable of making our own way back to him. In fact, left to ourselves, we don't even want to go back. Thirdly, we've seen that he came to give his life a ransom for many. In saving us from our sins, because our sins cannot be overlooked, they cannot be disregarded or ignored. The due penalty still needs to be paid in order that our release from sin might be secured for us. And Jesus came to pay the price by dying for us in our place. Then we saw that he's come to call sinners to repentance. Yes, he finds and saves you. Yes, he's dealt with your sins at the cross. But this saving work is done in order to reconcile you to your God so that you may know him and love him and walk with him in fellowship and trust him, depend on him, worship him. It's to be an active and conscious experiential thing and it requires a response from you in which you acknowledge your sin and your sorrow over your sin and you confess it and you turn from it that you might follow after Christ. And this morning we're looking at these four famous verses from John chapter 3. They help to pull together all of these truths for us this morning. And next Sunday we're going to conclude, God willing, by seeing that in the manger on that first Christmas day was the newborn king. So this morning we're turning to John chapter 3 and we're looking at these great verses beginning at verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So here's our the first of three points this morning. Number one is the world is in darkness and unbelief. If you were listening last Sunday afternoon, you'll have heard me say that God's saving and redeeming love 
is directed only towards those whom he has chosen, which he did before time began, Paul tells Timothy. And having chosen them, for them Jesus came. He said, I've come to save my people from their sins. For them he died, those he saved, and they are the ones whom he calls to himself. In our sins, we're actually the object of God's hatred and condemnation. But Ian, you might find yourself thinking to to yourself, you've just quoted probably the most famous verse in the Bible, which says that God so loved the world. Surely that contradicts what you said last week. Well, I understand why that might appear to be the case, but it shows you why it's so helpful and actually necessary not to read John 3.16 in isolation, but in the context of the whole Bible and even in the context of this little section with at least verses 17, 18 and 19 which follow it. You recall that last week I did acknowledge that there is a kind of love that God does have for the whole world in terms of his common grace that he shows to everybody day by day, supplying our daily needs. But in terms of this saving love and grace, it is actually directed only towards those whom God the Father has given to his Son. Verses 18 and 19 provide us with some corrective to thinking that God loves everyone exactly the same and that God has provided for everyone equally an escape route which is theirs to take if only they'll choose to take it. There's a sense in which that is true but there's also a reality which means that can't happen. The problem is Men love darkness rather than light. A few years back on one of our visits to Romania, we visited a cave. They seem to have a thing about caves. They've taken us to quite a few. Deep inside this particular cave, there were hundreds of bats flying around above our heads. Uh, We were safe though, even though we were in the region of Transylvania, they weren't vampire bats. They were high above, they were quite small, they were perfectly harmless. The cave was actually floodlit so that tourists could visit it. But when they turn out the light, the cave is plunged back into its natural state of total darkness. And this pitch blackness is the preferred dwelling place for these bats. They could fly out into the daylight, but they don't. They choose to remain in the dark. And that's how this world is spiritually held bound and captive in the blackness and darkness of its sin. Hold out the light of the gospel, point people to the one who is himself, the light of the world, and their natural reaction in their sinfulness, is to retreat ever deeper into the darkness. In our sinful state, we love to satisfy our sinful desires. In our sinful state, we lust after those things which are in accordance with unrighteousness, not righteousness. Greed and envy and immorality produce cravings. And those cravings can feel good to satisfy in our sinfulness. And we won't tolerate anything that gets in our way and stops us from satisfying those desires. The world loves its sins, promotes its sins, pursues its sins, indulges in sin, and resists any call to abandon sin. In contrast to the light of God's purity and righteousness and goodness, for us in our sin, the darker the better. 
Now, of course, we do recognize that in terms of individual lifestyles, there are differences as to how far this person will go in this area or that area compared to somebody else. And there are many things in our lives that can have an influence on the choices that we make. We don't deny that. Nevertheless, the trend in all of us, in our sin, is toward darkness rather than light. A simple example of that is that many of today's grandparents grew up in a generation when things like living together outside of marriage was frowned upon. Getting pregnant outside of marriage brought real shame upon your family. And those grandparents back then in their youth shared those moral values, more, more or less anyway, and agreed with them. Yet many of them, 20 or 30 years later, began to abandon those beliefs when it came to their own children. And today, probably have none of those expectations for their grandchildren. Well, everyone says, times have changed. And what they've actually done is retreated into the darkness and put up hardly any fight against it. Now, if you talk to people, they, of course, won't recognise that that's what's happened. But that's the Bible's analysis of these things because they love darkness rather than light. The world has put up very little resistance against that sliding away from biblical truth and moral values. It actually puts up a lot of resistance when you try and pull it back the other way towards righteousness. You'll hear some suggest that the church should have tried much harder and shouted much louder against this moral decline. And I can understand why people might think that way. And I understand the genuine concern which lies behind that. For myself, however, I really don't think that would have made much or any difference. Because with a Bible open in front of me, what I see is that no matter how hard or loud the church may have been, it wouldn't have made much difference. That's not because I'm defeatist, it's not because I lack faith. It's because of what I read in the Bible about the condition of the human heart. Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 5. He's writing to Christians and says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also loved us and has given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, no fornicator, unclean person, nor, nor covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Paul's talking to a church. He's talking to Christian believers, those who are born again. And what does he say they once were? He says they once were darkness. Now he doesn't use darkness to describe where they were in their sin, although they were in a place of darkness, but he actually uses darkness to describe 
how they were in their sin. They were in a state, in a condition of darkness. You cannot ask or expect darkness to act and behave like light. Paul knows what this dark world is like. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, idolatry. Everyone in the world is darkness. That's how you used to be in your unsaved years. But you've been transformed. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You now, as a Christian, you must behave like the light that you are as the world continues to behave as the dark that it is. Don't be partakers with them, he says. You must maintain the testimony and witness of a holy and righteous life in the light which accords with the gospel that you profess and proclaim. But it's foolishness to think that you can convince darkness to behave like light whilst it remains dark. You can shout and protest all you like, but it's still darkness. That the, that the UK ever appeared to be a Christian country has been shown to have been a fairly thin and quite fragile veneer, which in a few decades was quite easily rubbed away. And what it really is like underneath is being revealed. Those things have been there all along. The only thing that can really change any of this the only thing that can genuinely bring about change is when the darkness in one person and another and another and another is overcome as the light of Christ breaks in. That's what changes things. That's the only thing that can bring lasting change. And unless and until that happens, everyone outside of Christ remains in darkness and will therefore love darkness rather than light. And protesting against it isn't going to change that. The ultimate proof of this, verse 18, is that so very many remain in unbelief when it comes to the gospel that anyone anywhere will ever believe is actually the thing which is most remarkable. Because, secondly, unbelief and condemnation is our natural condition. Everyone likes to think that we're all born as good people. And as long as, you, as long as you can go through life and generally keep your nose clean, as the saying goes, then you don't really have too much to worry about. But verses 17 and 18 won't allow you to think that way. In our sin, we're born into a state of unbelief. We naturally are rebels when it comes to God and to his truth. Jesus came into a world which was already condemned because of its sin. And unbelief is the default position of the sinful heart. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Believing in Christ which is largely the same kind of believing as when you believe in the parachute that's strapped to your back as you jump out of an aeroplane. It's that kind of believing. You don't just believe that the parachute is there. 
you don't just believe that the parachute could save you if you jumped. It's a belief which actually enables you to put it on and then trust yourself to it as you jump out of the door at however many thousand feet up you are. And you then pull the ripcord in complete confidence that the thing is going to open and do its job and slow you down for a soft touchdown. The gospel and that salvation which God brings to men and women requires a believing in Christ, which is very similar to that. It's a believing which includes complete faith and trust. It's a believing which drives you to do something with that in which you believe. The man or woman who says that they believe in parachutes is not a parachutist until they've jumped out of a plane with the thing strapped on their back. They may watch others do it. They may go up in the plane with them and watch them jump out the door. They may even help them put the thing on, help them to repack it once they've landed. But you're not a parachutist unless you've actually made the leap of faith. Have you believed in? Sometimes the Bible puts it as believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't believed, you remain in the condemned condition in which you were born. In one sense, it doesn't really matter what else you may have done or not done. It all boils down to this. Have you, will you, believe in, trust in Christ for your salvation, for the salvation that you know you need? If you continue in your rejection of Jesus Christ as your personal Saviour and Lord, your unbelief will condemn you at his second coming. Like I said last week, your sinfulness is all about you and God. Your broken relationship with God, your sinfulness is what lies at the very centre of your broken relationship with him. And believing in Christ is the only remedy. Whoever believes in him will be saved. Whoever believes in Christ shall not perish. And this is our third and final thought this morning. Whoever believes in him shall be saved, shall not perish. Now I need to begin this third and final point by clearing up the apparent confusion in the, in the use of the word world. God so loved the world that the world through him might be saved. Because in things that we've seen recently, it's, it's very apparent that the whole world does not believe, hasn't ever believed, will not believe, and is not saved. But you see, these verses also include this issue of believing and not believing. The reality of what we read in the New Testament and the things that Jesus himself has said have proved true. Jesus said that many are called but few are chosen and that many go through the wide gate rather than the narrow gate. Many choose to walk the broad road which leads to destruction rather than the narrow path which leads to life everlasting. And that being the case, why is it then that we have this use of the word world? How does that fit in with what I said last week about God's hatred being upon sinners? How can I say that one week but then the next week read that God so loved the world? Well, how do we explain this? Those upon whom God has set his electing love and grace 
are known only to him. When Jesus arrived in this world, he wasn't holding in his hand a list of names and dates of birth so that we could know and see who it was would become a Christian. But what we discover is that Christ's life and ministry was open for all to see and he spoke to all in the same way with the one message. His death and resurrection was open for all to see. The apostles preached the gospel to anyone and everyone. Nothing was hidden or secret. Christ came into the world and the world saw and heard him. His commission to his disciples was to, say, was to take the saving good news of the gospel into the whole world. God has prescribed the method by which his elect are to be gathered in. And it's to proclaim Christ to the whole world. And from amongst the world, his sheep will hear his voice and follow him. To point the whole world to Christ and to declare that in him, God's saving love is seen for all who will believe. This is the gospel message. This is what we are to do as the Lord's people. Those who will believe on Christ will come from every tribe and tongue and nation and from across all generations. And this message is to be declared to the whole world. The whole world is called to look to the cross and to see God's love being outpoured in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at God's love for sinners like you as we draw your attention to the cross. And the whole world is to be addressed with this gospel message. But we discover that the word of God and the gospel is a two-edged sword. For some, it will pierce them through and cause them to repent and to trust in Christ. But for many, it will pierce them, but only provoke them and cause them to harden their hearts even more against him and to confirm them in their unbelief. The gospel is that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So the gospel comes to this one and this one and this one and points them to Christ and says, look at how God has loved the world. Repent and believe in him. Christ is to be presented to the whole world as the world's saviour. And they are left without excuse as they reject him in their sin, loving darkness rather than light. There will not be any who are saying within themselves, it's just not fair. I so much want to believe on Christ, but God hasn't chosen me, so I can't. There won't be any people thinking like that. No, you having seen the demonstration of God's love in that while sinners were still in their sin, Christ died for sinners, they're saying, no, thank you. That's just not for me. And Jesus helps us to, to understand these things. When we hear him pray to his heavenly father in, in John chapter 17, Jesus is the one who in John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. But listen to him praying. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 
I have glorified you on the earth. I finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to those whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. Who is he praying for? Those who have believed in him. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All are mine, are yours. Yours are mine. I'm glorified in them. And I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And so Jesus, you see, speaks there of the fact that, yes, he's come into the whole world to demonstrate to the whole world the love that God has towards those sinners whom he would save. But it's those whom God has given him who will come to him. And this is the glorious privilege that we have as Christian people to have been brought under this saving love and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world because it's, it's condemned already. If you're still not a Christian, if you're still in unbelief, you're condemned already, but God has sent his Son that the world through him might be saved. And that's the truth and the reality that you, today, right now, must deal with. Jesus came into the world to demonstrate God's love and grace for sinners at the cross, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever drinks of the water that he shall give will never thirst. Whoever believes in him will not abide in darkness. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the gospel which is brought to you this morning. You must decide. Will you believe on him and trust in him that you might be saved? from all your sins. Come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Let's sing that hymn as we close.
Let's pray together. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen.